Thank you for letting me record tonight for those who are regulars who can't join us. We are in Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 9. I apologize for my bad um, wardrobing tonight. I've got a blue shirt with a pink jacket because I'm in the hospital and I'm freezing to death. And it was either wrap myself up in the blanket or ask Evie, could I purloin her, her jacket until I escape here at 945 and go back home and get better clothes? But we're, we're in an exciting chapter tonight. And I think to sort of set the stage, let me share that Hebrews is answering questions about who Jesus is in relationship to how Jesus functioned. Um, in relationship to the Old Testament. So <clears throat> all these laws, all these ceremonies, all these sacrifices, all these things that a Jewish person would know, but they didn't know how Christ fit into it. So throughout the book of Hebrews, there's a theme of how does Jesus fit into all this? So it, it's very important for us when we read through the big book of Hebrews to not only understand what's being said about Jesus, but what's being said about Jesus in relationship to the Old Testament and specifically the Old Testament sacrificial system, which is a big part of the message uh, of Hebrews. So it, does that help set the stage as we jump into chapter nine for everyone? In the Bible, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament and testament means covenant. And covenant is an agreement between two parties. So when we talk about the old covenant, we're talking about the way in which God was working with people during this Old Testament period. You know, the time that covers the books that we have in our Old Testament. And then the New Testament period covers the life of Christ and many of the apostles' letters and the things that had to do with the Christ coming in and bringing in this new covenant. So we're tempted to take the new covenant for granted, and we're tempted not to see how it relates to the old covenant. The writer to Hebrews is trying to do is, is bridge the gap and say, the old covenant was imperfect, and it was always looking towards a new covenant that would be brought into being by a person, and that person we know was Jesus. So with that in mind, grab your Bibles, chapter 9. Who would like to read? 9, 1 to 5. I can read the earthly holy place. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. Having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail okay <clears throat> so what in verse one is the writer to hebrews talking about this is the summary statement about the tent um not yet well okay Wait, wait, wait. You're, you're right. It is about the tent, but it's about what in relationship to the tent? You're correct. It is the tent. But what is it about the tent? The rules and worship and the fifth agreement. Rules concerning worship. Now, anyone who's lived in Asia knows that there are rules. Am I correct? If, if there's... Anything I learned, especially in living in Indonesia, there's rules and rules are very important. Well, to the he Hebrews, rules were very important with regards to divine worship. And the reason why the rules were important is because God 
was telling the people, this is how I want to worship you. Now, this is very different from the way people think about worship. People think about worship in relationship to what they want to do rather than pleasing the one who's revealed himself and has told us how he wants to be worshiped. So right in Hebrews 9.1, we're hit with what's called the regulative principle, where what God says about himself and about how he wants to be worshiped regulates how he is to be worshiped. So the writer to Hebrews makes a comment about the fact that there were regulations um, of divine worship and as I was mentioning, the earthly sanctuary. So <clears throat> think about that for a moment. How is this different from other religions? Here we have a God who is telling us how he wants to be worshipped. How is this different from other religions? Well, they worship, some of them are worshipping um, a lot of gods and idols. Okay. So you're saying it's different because there's one God here. Yeah. Okay, what about the rest of you? How does verse 1 bring us into a completely different idea when it comes to worship? Oh, it's an earthly place of holiness. Um, and contrast this with other religions. Well, other religions are uh, worshipping dead people. Okay, so the person or the spirit who's being worshipped is different in other religions. That's yeah. part of it. Um, but how do people in other religions know how to worship? That's the question. How do they get their regulations for worship? Through a book, same way. Always? Don't know. Maybe it's man-made rules. I think so much of what people call Christianity today has nothing to do with what the good book says. Um, for, for example, go through the Psalms, okay? It talks about worship. Um, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Praise the Lord with symbols and, and, and loud this and stringed instruments and shout unto the Lord. And uh, David danced before the Lord. And you try and do that and most churches today and people think you're crazy you know everybody's worried about getting the vaccine there's something in the vaccine that's going to get you well people are much more worried about you know going to a church where you might get close enough to be vaccinated with the holy spirit um but my point is this god revealed in the old testament how he wanted to be worshiped and both in the old testament and in the new testament we who are Christians aren't doing it. So we're doing what we prefer rather than what God commands. Whereas, and that's the problem of Christianity, but the problem in other religions is sort of similar. They're often not worshiping according to their book, even though they have a book. Many, many religions do have a book and they're not worshiping exactly the way that they're supposed to uh, concerning the book. But the other problem with so many religions is, is they're making up their own rules. But see, here's the point. We're doing the same thing that the other religions are doing when we don't worship God the way he tells us he wants to be worshipped. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the point. And that's the point that comes from verse one of chapter nine. And it's something we need to really, really take seriously. Um, this whole idea of worship is a very, very important subject, and we've reduced it to what we prefer rather than what God commands or what we feel comfortable with. The, the, the Bible – I'm sorry. I'm no, go, go on, go on, go on. Sorry. No, no, no. I'd rather hear from you. I'm just thinking in my mind that the reason why it's so important, and, uh, which I didn't have, haven't realized, but, but now you say that is because – if we start to veer away, then we get all these, like, the Catholic religion, religious things. So we've got to try and stick to it, even my, it, though it may sign, sound a bit, you know, harsh or legalistic. The problem is, if we do it on our own, we're going to go way away from the real thing. So, I mean, you know, I, I get what you're saying. I well, 
there are a lot of worship songs that that take their texts right from scripture. Yeah. One of my favorite ones is is called "Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker." Um, but when, <clears throat> but when, um, that song is sung, it's telling us to do something. Come. It's an invitation. Let us, everybody who's together for the worship, worship and bow down. Okay. Well, if the congregation doesn't bow down at that point, I have a real hard time singing the song because it's just, and then the other one is, is, you know, people talk about, uh, I lift my hands to, to the Lord and they stand there like this. You know, so I, I'm sorry. I just, I, I can't, I can't do this. So I've been a music director for a lot of my, my, my adult ministry life. And I refuse to pick hand, hand raising songs or kneeling songs, unless the congregation is going to be willing to do that. And if they're not willing to do that, then I want to sort of like stay away from those songs because I can't deal with the hypocrisy of it all. Well, I'm just a, a bad, flawed, tragic Christian, okay? Imagine the God of the universe who has a real hard time with people not doing what it is that he tells them to do when it comes to how they're supposed to be acknowledging how worthy he is. I'm sorry, Pastor Tim. Can I ask something? Absolutely. Thank you. It's, it's in uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. they telling us to worship in a different way? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> there are similarities as to the actions that we do, but there were different rules. So verse 1 says there were regulations concerning the divine worship that had to do with the earthly sanctuary in the Old Testament. And that's changed in light of Christ, and we're going to see how it's changed. But my point is, is when it comes to the actual activities that believers, not the high priest, not the priest, but what believers did in the Old Testament through the Psalms and in, in, the, in the New Testament um, through Christian worship, there are very, very many similarities. Does that make sense? There's a lot of differences. Yes. But there's a lot of similarities. So, so at this point, I'm I'm drawing back from verse one to make a bigger point, which is that God tells us how He wants to be worshipped. We don't come up with it on our own. So we and just God, follow what what the New Testament say. Well, what do you do with the Old Testament? Then? So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with. How much of the Old Testament is still um, in place for us in our worship today and how much has changed? So the whole question of continuity and change is what Hebrews deals with. Continuity between the Old and the New Testament, change. Okay, so let's look at it in, in detail. So we're talking about the regulations in the Old Testament. What were the regulations verse 2 is telling us about? What, he, it tells he, us what, what's in the place called the holy place. Say that again. <laughs> um, it, it tells you about like the holy place, um, it, the first section of the tent. Okay. And what is that first section called in verse 2? The holy place. Do you see the words, the outer one? There was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one. Hmm. That's what my verse says. No. It's called the first section in the ESV. Okay. And what was in there? Um, a lampstand mm -hmm. and the table and the bread of the presence. Okay. And what was that place called? The holy place. Okay. And then verse 3 goes on to describe a different place. What does it say? It was the most holy place, second room. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And what's in there? What did you find in there? Yeah, that's where the um, the wooden chest, gold incense altar, and the Ark of the Covenant was. Right. And how did the Ark of the Covenant look? Covered in gold. <laughs> and what was in the Ark? Okay, manna, and what else? <clears throat> there are three things, okay? There's three things. Three Aaron's, things. Aaron's rod. Okay. Aaron's rod, which budded. Now, can someone help me understand what on earth is he talking about? Aaron has a rod that budded. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so who wants to fill in the story? Let's see what's the reference number here. Number seventeen ten. Was that uh was that when Moses stood before wait wait uh Moses had the rod and was it before the Pharaoh or uh another incident? Hey, hey, hey. Making us go back in the old testament. I am. I'm making you go back to Numbers chapter 17, verse 8. So there's, we're going back to figure out what is this bud, okay? We can't read about, I mean, this, what is this rod which budded? We can't read about this in Hebrews without knowing what it is. So let's go back. Yeah. Numbers 17, 8 through 11. Who wants to read that? Okay, I'll read it. All right, so Numbers 17, starting at verse 8. Actually, yeah. you could back up a little bit. and Yeah, you can back up a little bit. Why don't you tell us yeah, where you want to start? Really, the, really, from the beginning of the chapter, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and get from them a rod for each father's household. Twelve rods from all their leaders according to their father's households. You shall write each name on his rod and write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. For there is one rod for the head of each of the father's household. You shall then deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. And it will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Thus I shall lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. So I guess people were mad at Moses and Aaron in the previous uh -huh. chapter. Um, <clears throat> Moses therefore spoke to the sons of Israel and all their leaders gave him a rod apiece for each leader according to their father's households, 12 rods, but the rod of Aaron among their rods. So Moses deposited the rods before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. Then, now it came about on the next day that Moses went into the tent of the testimony. And behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. Moses then brought out all the rods from the presence of the Lord to all the sons of Israel. And they looked, and each man took his rod. But the Lord said to Moses, put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumblings against me so that they should not die. So Moses did just as the Lord had commanded, had commanded him. So he did. Verse 11. What's the significance yeah. of verse 11? You mean verse 11 where I stopped or 12? Yes. Verse 11. 11. Hmm. That just as the Lord commanded him, he put the butted rod back in to the oh. Holy of Holies. So verse 1 speaks of the regulations. And now we're looking at what's in the tap, what's in the Ark of the Covenant. There are three things in it. And one of the things is in there because God commanded it and Moses did it and it had to do with the with the rod that budded now what's this rod budding stuff about well god god wanted to confirm that he had chosen 
um, the house of Levi to be priests and Aaron as the high priest at that time. And so whenever anything went wrong, while the, while the Israelites were in the wilderness, they always wanted to overthrow the leadership of Moses and Aaron. So God was reconfirming that he had chosen these leaders. Yep. And so how did he do it? What did he do with the rod? Made it come to life. Not only come to life, but what else happened? He bore fruit, <laughs> bore almond, flowers and almonds. Yeah. And so what's inside the ark now? That rod. The rod which budded. Do you see that? Yeah. This isn't a stick to remind them of what God had done before. This is the rod which budded. Does that send chills up your spine, people? Mm. God miraculously chose to take a stick that was separated and cut off from the tree and make it bud miraculously. So, and, and in so doing, um, he reminded the people that of who he was and what he wanted. So in addition to a rod inside the ark, what else? What was the first thing we skipped over the first thing? Well, yeah, we said manna, Right, manna in a golden jar. Yeah, manna in a golden jar, but we didn't talk about what that is. Manna? Wasn't manna the um, the food that was provided in the de desert? Okay, I got to tell you guys what happened. This week or yesterday, Abby goes to fix food for me. And I have to have my food blended because, I don't know, my stomach's getting weird. So... So I asked her to put some chicken and some rice in the blender. And then Evie got some veggies out of the refrigerator. Yeah, leftovers. Oops. That were left over. And she didn't look at them carefully or sniff them before throwing them in the blender. And after Oopsie. a week, after a week, <laughs> these veggies were not wholesome and nourishing anymore. <laughs> And they she were made slimy. a stinky, slimy soup for my oh. dinner. Well, now, I saw, I didn't serve it to you. Don't make it sound I, like that. I, I didn't saw, say that you I saw it before it I even ran the blender. Okay. By then well, they were touching, they were touching the good stuff. So here's my point. Thing out and start over. We have <laughs> refrigerators and it keeps our food for a long time. Was the Ark a refrigerator? No. Yeah. No. But what's in it, people? Food. It no. doesn't say it's crusty bread. Doesn't say it's weak old veggies that smell and taste terrible. It says manna. Manna. Miraculous manna. Miraculous bud. Do you see that? Every act of worship and the temple was a reminder of the miraculous God who had saved them. And we just read this fact. Eh, they rhymed about it. The golden jar with man in it. You know. No. <laughs> you cannot do that. I will not allow you to do that. Not in my house. You have to take the time to see it. And then if that weren't enough, to make chills run up our spine. What's the third thing that's in the art? The tablet of a covenant. And who brought the tablets down? Moses. Who brought the tabs down? Moses. Who brought the tabs down? <laughs> Moses. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, um, it, it's... It's Moses. Moses brought them down and they were 
They're here called not the Ten Commandments. They're called something else. What are they called? Uh, the tablets, tablets of the Covenant. Right. Covenant. And the Covenant tells us how God wants to enter into a, a relationship with us. So these Ten Covenants, these Ten Commandments are part of a covenant whereby this is God telling the people again, this is how I want to be worshipped. This is how I want to be worshipped. I want to be worshipped by you setting aside the Sabbath day. I want to be worshipped um, alone without you worshipping other gods. I don't want you to worship me with pictures or idols or images. I don't want you to lie. I don't want you to steal. I don't want you to commit adultery. I want you to honor your father and mother. I don't want you to covet what someone else has. And that's the way you worship me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these tablets are called the tablet of the old covenant. Now, the tabernacle, the ark, the tablets, it's all part of the old covenant. Okay. And keep in mind, the writer to Hebrews is trying to say, how does the old covenant fit together with the new covenant? And what does it have to do with Jesus? Now, now we can go on. Verse five. Who would like to read verses 5 through 7? I can. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshading the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room and did only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins that people had committed in ignorance. Okay, so let's stop there and let's go back and take a look at it. Okay, so... Above the tables of the covenant, in verse 5, what was there? The cherubim. Cherubim. Yes. And then, in the middle of painting this beautiful picture, what does he do in the second half of verse 5? What a preacher does when he looks at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> What does he do? Not, not going to go into great detail right now. No, we, we can't go into detail about this. I, I, I wish they we can had go time. back and re read Exodus if they want all the details. <laughs> right. But he just pulled the, 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 the preacher um, shut everything off thing. Okay. We cannot now speak in detail about the rest. Okay. Now he makes a summary point in verse six. Don't go past verse six, people. Just verse six. What's the first summary point? The priests go uh, into the first section performing their duties there. And who are the priests? The Levites. The Levites from, from the tribe where the rod budded. I did, yeah. And so we have a connection to the rod again. So the ones who were going into that place are the ones who were commanded. More than commanded, they were the ones who were selected by God. Now let's move on. But, and there's a but. Whenever the sentence begins with but, you got to pay attention. <laughs> so what's the next place being spoken of in verse 7? Not the outer place, but what? The inner place. Holy of Holies. Right. The Holies place. And who goes in that? High priest. The high priest. How often does he go? The year. And what does he take? Blood. What does he take with him? <laughs> Blood. Blood. He takes the blood. Blood. And he offers that up for whom? 
for himself, to God for himself, and, and for uh, the and for the people who are committing committed with for the sins the people committed. But it says committed in ignorance. I must confess yeah, that these last, these last two words of chap of verse seven really disturbed me because I need somebody to offer up blood for the sins that I committed with full knowledge, not the not the sins that I've committed in ignorance. I'm not saying that I haven't committed sins that I didn't know were wrong, but my problem here, people, is not the sins that I didn't know were wrong. Um but my problem is the sins that I know are wrong. You see the difference? Mm. But now, I'm, making, I'm making bad jokes, then. I'm not make, making bad jokes. I'm being absolutely serious. Desma, <laughs> what were you saying, Desma? Oh, no, my guy. <laughs> okay. Well, now the Holy Spirit's going to enter into the picture in verse 8. And verse 8 and verse 9. Who wants to read that? Another point, and this is a good one. Who wants to read verses 8 and 9? Just two verses. I can. Okay, go for it. The Holy Spirit uses these two separate rooms to teach us that the way into the most holy place was not open while the first room was still there. This is an example for us today. It shows that the gifts and the sacrifices the priests offer to God are not able to make the consciences of the worshippers completely clear. So what's the point? Who could get into the second place? Only one, the high priest. And who got into the first place? The other, the other priests. Okay. So that means that the holy place has not been opened. As long as you've got an outer tabernacle still standing. And then he says, it's a symbol for what? In verse 9. It's uh, a symbol present, for what? Present age. Yes. The temple was still standing. At this point in time. Wow. And, and the symbolic references that he's speaking about were very much in people's minds. And we know that because in verse 9, he speaks in the present tense. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Hmm. This is sometime between when Christ died in 70 A.D., when you've still got temple worship happening and both gifts and sacrifices are being offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Isn't that our problem, everybody? We think about worshiping and going before a pure and holy God, but what bothers us is our conscience and it scares us away. How many times have we been scared of God and ran away from praying? Because it's like, God doesn't want to talk to me. Actually, I'm a little bit afraid of God. He, he knows what I did on the weekend. So, so uh, we have a problem here, and the problem is our conscience. So what specifically is the point made about the conscience? What about uh, these sacrifices and the conscience? They, they can't perfect the conscience. conscience. They, um, they don't quite work. For the guilt. It doesn't do it, does it? Right. No, it didn't do it for them. And then verse 10 says, because those gifts and sacrifices only related to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. They were like external things. You know how your mom would always say, wash your hands or, or something like that. And it, so much of people's behavior um, is external. 
One time I went to China and uh, I was struggling with a retinal detachment. I couldn't see very well. And they wanted me to, to use slippery chopsticks to eat my um, rice. And I looked at them and I said, I'm sorry, people, but I am not using um, chopsticks today. Give me a fork. And, and part of the reason why, why was because I couldn't see in the bottom part of my eye. At, well, I was blind in the left part of my eye and in the right part of my eye, um, my right eye, it was covered with a patch. So I was in this terrible situation where I couldn't see the rice and I wasn't going to go digging into a bowl with, with my chopsticks and then have the rice fall out and never make it to my face. You know, so then I've got a big mess on the table and nothing tasty in, in my stomach. And you would have thought that I skinned cats that were screaming, you know, all the way to their deathbed uh, because I had asked for a fork. I asked for a fork and it just about caused um, the Great Wall of China to fall down on the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, pe people got so upset and it had to do with external things. Well, if you think the Chinese are bad with their love of chopsticks, then, and you ain't never done nothing until you've done the Chinese peanut um, grasping contest where you, where you have a bowl and it's full of peanuts and then you have to take your chopsticks and then move the peanuts from one, run one bowl to the other. Well, if you think that was something, you have no idea. Imagine the Jews and all this stuff about, well, you got to wash this this way and you can't wash this that way. So you've got all these rules and the rules are deadly because if you don't do the right thing, then God's not going to be happy. And who knows what's going to happen to the high priest when he steps in that holy place. If he goes in and does the wrong thing, he's going to screw it up for himself. He's going to screw it up for all of us. So the Jews led the, the Jews were in constant fear that somebody was going to do something wrong connected to worship. And the problem with this is it never took away the things they were most concerned about, which were their actual sins of the heart, their sins of the conscience. So here's the point. They couldn't do anything. And then verse 11 begins with a but. And here comes the contrast between this old covenant, this old system, these old rules, and then what Christ did. So we need someone to read verse 11 through 12. I can. Okay. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and cows, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Okay. So, the contrast is between the Old Testament and then the New Testament. What did Christ do when he appeared? Um, he appeared as a high priest. Okay. Of what? The good things that have come. Okay. And what tabernacle did he enter? Which tabern tabernacle did he enter? And more like a spiritual one, a more perfect one. The most mm -hmm. holy place. And is it of this world or is it not of this world? No, not of this world. No, he entered some other place. What's it called? Heaven. What's it? Where did Jesus go? Where did he enter? We know he didn't enter with the blood of bulls and goats. But where he, did he go? He went. He went to heaven. At at his, after his resurrection, he ascended to the Father. Is that what he's referring to? Yes, and he entered the holy place once for all. That's who he did it for, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, that word coming as it is 
in verse 12 must have gotten the attention of the Hebrews in, in a very, very strong way because this word redemption means that your sins have been paid for and have been atoned for. And now we have the ability to have our consciences made clean. Before that, we didn't have the ability. When Christ actually did the perfect thing, then he obtained eternal redemption. Christ did it. The Old Testament laws and sacrifices, they pointed to something that hadn't been done yet. And then Christ came and did it. Christ came and did it. Um, something that had never been done yet that needed to be done if people were ever going to be able to deal with their guilty consciences. You know, you guys are going to run into people who have really guilty consciences. And where do people go to try and deal with it? Alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol. Where else? Um, further sinning. Yeah. Further sinning. Um, you know, they, they run farther away from God. Where else do they go? Wherever they can go to Sabbath, often sometimes false religions go. They go to an easier religion, don't they? They go to some place where the rules aren't quite as strong or severe. But it doesn't do it. It doesn't ultimately cleanse the conscience. The only thing that can cleanse the conscience is to know that Christ went all the way up there into the most holy place, and he made it. And he obtained eternal rede redemption. So when reading this about where Christ was, what he did, and who he did it for, this must have completely blown the minds of those who, re who read this. Because he's telling them Christ brought in something new, and it relates to our conscience. Any questions? I'm going to stop here for a moment. Do you think okay. there's some people who couldn't um, couldn't believe that Jesus did that for us? Bingo. This is incredible stuff. What man could not do to save himself, God did for us. That must have gotten their attention. And even, even knowing that God had died for our sins, um, it's quite inconceivable to some people. Who... Sure. Mm. Yeah, it's inconceivable. What else are you going to say about that, Desma? Well, you know, they're probably so still so deep in their sin that they um, they just can't believe it can be that easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus, but they couldn't believe that he actually sacrificed his life. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Jean. Yo. Sorry, this is uh, now about sacrifice. May I, may I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, this is about the Hebrews. Uh, verse, where, uh, chapter 7. Yeah. And verse 27. Okay. He said, he said that uh, in, in my Bible. He said he uh, sacrificed himself one time and forever. Uh, my question is: His is Jesus own self? This is or this is uh, Father God? And uh, uh, let, let me let me ask you uh, continue something else. If you remember uh, last time when I met you, I came with my friend. And he asked he asked a question about in Genesis about Genesis uh, chapter four and there is uh, I mean the Adams has two sons and one of them uh, he bring uh, I don't know how to say it in English he bring uh, a gift for God uh, like a sheep and sac uh, sacrifice for God and he brings something from his form and God accept. Uh, Adam's son who sacrificed a sheep or something like that. So I want to say, I, I'm sorry, uh, this is 
already more than one year in my mind. This is any, any connection, sacrifice here in Genesis chapter four, what Adam's son sacrificed the sheep for God. And here Jesus or Father God sacrificed his own son for uh, for I mean for our our sin and is there any connection with this sacrifice or God telling us to sacrifice something? That's a good question. Who wants to jump in and answer it? Well, it is, it is um, connected because blood has to be spilled for sins to be reconciled. And um, it's, all, it's all the same thread. And he refused to accept the one that didn't, the gift that didn't have the blood. And he accepted the gift that were, was actually a live animal. It's a lot deeper than that, I'm sure, but that's, I think that's the essence, isn't it? Then how he has to know God, what, what God uh, uh, accepts. Adam has two sons. How, how so does I, the other son need, how do they know? How do they yes. know? I have no idea. Well, I'm know. sorry, maybe, maybe there is any, no any connection to us, but this is there more is than connection. one year. In, in my mind about this question, about sacrifice. Is God telling us to do sacrifice something still? No, I think the book of Hebrews is clear on that point, that Jesus offered a sacrifice once for all, the perfect sacrifice. Um, and it's contrasted with the Old Testament sacrifices that were imperfect and had to be continual because they were imperfect. Well, Christ did it did it the best, did it once. So it's, it's not any connection with Adam's son sacrificed something for God and with Jesus sacrificed his life for us. No connection with, um, between these two. Well, what do you mean by no connection? I mean, uh, Adam's son sacrificed the sheep for God and God accepted that. And and in New Testament, uh, Jesus, Jesus come and he died for us. And my question is, Jesus sacrificed his own own life by his 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 decision, or it was God Almighty's decision. I know everything is planning of God. May I say uh, something? Yes, well, it is. Uh, these are good questions. Um, would you like to answer the question? I, I'm not sure I can answer, but maybe um, it's an idea. Uh, sacrifice, God asked us to give. Um, it's actually always the, the most precious what we have in life. So it's the oldest son or the own life or whatever. Um, if I'm thinking about myself, what I want to give for him, it is I will. I want to give up my ego, so I, I don't. I'm. I'm not sure um, the the connection in between. But um, I think the the most precious is to be given, and um, I would say in in the New Testament it is something has to be connected to ourselves. In the Old Testament, that was. I don't know. It was the sun or the the most beloved animal they had, or whatever. But the most precious. I don't know. It's an answer, but it's in something I just. Yeah. I Can I say something? Please. Yeah, I think that's right. I think he asked for the best in many parts. Well, I don't know how many parts of the Bible. He asked for the best, but. The most precious thing in our lives is life, and that's probably that may be a reason for blood's got to be spilled. To um, uh, if sin is made to, to reconcile that sin, and that's yeah, what but just the body. It's not. It's not the spiritual. I think in the New Testament. Um, Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. 
Yeah, I'm talking about the Old Testament right now. In the New Testament, with the, 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 the supreme blood has been spilt already for us. So we sacrifice something very different. We sacrifice our lives to worship the Lord. That's, that's what we do. In the New Testament, it's very different because it's already been done once by Jesus, the high priest. So we don't have to sacrifice blood anymore. We sacrifice our, lo- our lives for, G- for, for the one who did. Does that make sense? <clears throat> but blood has to be involved in the Old Testament, for sure. And in the New Testament, uh, with Christ's blood. Yes, it makes sense, but but uh, well, I, uh, one element yes, yes, that one element that we haven't brought out is that um, the events of Genesis occurred before the formal giving of the law to Moses in Exodus. So you have to first of all, you have to recognize that not every detail of everything of every interaction between God and man is necessarily recorded in Genesis, just some highlights of ancient, of ancient history, right? So Uh there was apparently some degree of understanding between man and God during the events of Genesis about sacrifice and things, but until the full revelation of the law later during Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness, there wasn't as much detail and as many instructions given. But but all through, you know, all through the ancient times before that, there was some, apparently some light of revelation given by God to, to the people that were leading up to Abraham and, because Abraham had some understanding of sacrifices of the covenant with God. And, um, yes, but that was all before the formal law was given. So the Old Testament is a progression of, of God's revelation through, through Moses and the prophets and through his interactions with certain people in history. Mm-hmm. And the progression leads up to the coming of Christ. Christ is the ultimate revelation of God to mankind. So, you know, we, we've received the fullness of God's revelation in Christ and, and the fullness of sacrifice. Um, also, also, I think we need to be careful if we talk about... Um, Yes, we, we give our lives to Christ. The New Testament also talks about the fact that believers are identified with him, that there's a sense in which we've, we've been crucified and we no longer live, but Christ lives in us and we are resurrected with him. So we kind of have an identity together with him now. And um, I, I think we got to be careful to not view our Christian life, like, like I have to do something sacrificial yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to make exactly. to prove to God that I'm worthy or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that's the problem we're running into is, is because in the old Testament, men did things, but it never completely got them right in the sight of God. In the new Testament, God did, and it completely <laughs> fixed everything that was wrong. But yet, People still want to go back to their own uh, attempts. And this and this gets back to what I was saying in verse 1. Again, how do we worship God? We worship God the way he has revealed himself as wanting to be worshipped. And we know that he wants to be worshipped um, through, through believing in the sacrifice that he provided now. So what I want you to do, um, uh, we're, we're not going to finish the chapter um, because we got to go someplace else right now to be able to, to figure this out. We need to go to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. 
And I, I want you to read this out loud with everything in mind that we've talked about tonight and with questions in, in mind. Um, who wants to go to Romans 8, 1 through 4 and read this for us? After you read it, I think you'll see why it ties together everything that we've read in the book of Hebrews to this point. Who wants to read this? Romans 8, 1 through 4. I'll read it. Okay. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, with no longer, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Okay, how, how do these verses tie together everything that we've seen so far in Hebrews up to this point? The guilty I'm, conscience. I'm sorry, Pastor Tim, I still don't understand. Well, we're trying to make it simple, okay? And... We're going to go through these verses, and and then hopefully you'll get it. You'll understand it a little bit more. Um, but the first thing I want you to see is remember how we were talking about the guilty conscience. Remember, or, or yes. earlier we saw in the passage. Yes. Well, how how does verse one relate to the guilty conscience? It says there's no condemnation, so you don't need to feel a heavy burden of guilt. Okay. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. So this is a parallel with the book of Hebrews. And then in verse 2, it explains why it is that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. is because something that's happened to us, what's called the law, the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has set us free from the law of sin and death. Then verse 3 expands upon that and then talks about what the Old Testament law that we've been reading about tonight, the Old Covenant, could not do because it was weak um, uh, because of our sinful nature and our weakness. And what we couldn't do through the Old Testament, God did. He sent his son, like a man, just like the people who who did the temple service in the Old Testament were men. God sent his own son as a human being, but instead of offering up the blood of bulls and goats, he offered up himself. And in so doing, he knocked out sin in our bodies in order that the true regulation that God has on us, the requirement of the law, could be worked out in us, could be fulfilled in us, could be practiced in us, because now we don't walk as the old covenant did in the flesh, but we now walk according to the spirit of the living God who lives in us when we are joined to Christ. So these verses sort of tie together a lot of what's going on. Um, But one thing you got to get away from is the idea that we sacrifice ourselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. You got to get away from that. Christ sacrificed himself. We believe it. And yes, God might call us to acts of service, acts of mercy, acts of worship, acts of leadership of the church. God might call us to some radical acts of obedience, but we do not sacrifice ourselves. Impossible. Just like it was impossible for the priests to offer up the right sacrifice, even when they were doing it according to the rules in the Old Testament. We don't sacrifice ourselves not in the way that christ had to sacrifice himself for sin so the problem of man-made religion is people always trying to do something to sacrifice themselves to make themselves acceptable 
as religious believers. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work. And that's the point of Hebrews. That's the point of Romans. We can't do it ourselves. The Old Testament couldn't do it through the rules. God did it. Yeah. The, but the Old Testament sacrifice was pointing toward Christ. Pointing yes. toward the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. Yes. Exactly. So it was um, mm -hmm. to convict people of the sinful nature of people and the holiness of God. Yeah. And wake them up. Wake them up to the need for forgiveness. Can I ask something now? Absolutely. You know why? I mean, so difficult and complicated situation now. <laughs> and, you know, I have two options. One, still staying waiting for United Nations to maybe one day choose a new country for me. Mm -hmm. And so I can go to new country and get united in my, my family. The mm -hmm. other option is I go back to my country and turn on my country, I go to visit or stay with my family. But I cannot go back to my country. If I go back there in airport, they will chase me because they know I become Christian. And, you know, I cannot deny Jesus. I remember in Bible said Jesus said, if you deny me, I will deny you later. I don't know what to do. So if, if I go back to my country, if I don't deny Jesus, they will put me in the jail or they're going to kill me. I don't know. Or at least put me in the jail for a long time until I deny Jesus. And I cannot do that. I become Christian since 2000. So it's 21 years. I really believe in him so yeah. deeply. I am in so difficult situation. So if, if if I go to if I go back to my country and I don't deny Jesus, so it means I sacrifice myself. I don't complain. I'm not any problem with that. I don't have any problem. They want to kill me. They want to put me in the jail for a long time. Whatever they want to do with me, I'm fine. I I don't know my, my my still I don't understand about sacrifice. Okay. Our hearts go out to you very deeply because of the pain that you've experienced in being separated from your family and from your country. And there's no way that we can fully understand or sympathize with everything you've gone through. Our hearts go out and where our hearts can't understand our prayers go up for you and for your family and for your country and for all that you and, and your believers and our brothers and sisters in Christ are experiencing. And uh, don't misunderstand me. We're talking about two different things. We're talking about, the first thing we're talking about is, is, is how people's sins are forgiven before God. And that is something that's a sacrifice that we can't make that God had to make for us. And in that sense, it's unrepeatable. It's done once for all by the sacrifice of Christ. And it's very unique and it's different from the Old Testament and the new. There is though, the sense in which the believer who is joined to Christ might be called by God to not deny the Lord, but to stand up for the Lord. And therefore you might in a sense, sacrifice in a human sense your life, but not to redeem or pay for your sins, but instead to obtain a greater reward in heaven. And there, that form of sacrifice, um, including sacrifices of praise, as well as like missionaries who have given their lives to going and serving in other countries, that type of sacrifice is part of our Christian life. But what we're talking about is, is that it doesn't pay for sin. And so we need to be very, very careful because many people think that by giving up their own lives, they're getting rid of their sin. Now, is that clear? Is that point clear before we move on? Yes. Okay. So what you're talking about God might be calling you to is a separate thing. Um, and it's part of what we call Christian discipleship, following Jesus on the road of the cross. Every believer has to sacrifice in some way. Even if we don't completely give up our life, 
Um, Jesus says, if any man wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's saying that there's going to be suffering and hardship and loss in, in being a Christian and living the Christian life. That's part of the Christian life. But because we experience that, that isn't the reason why God forgives us. The reason why God forgives us is because the sins have been paid for in Christ. So to get back to your question, what should you do? Um, that's a hard one. Because you have to go where you feel like God is leading you and is directing you. And if you say to us that God is calling you to go back to the Middle East to be a witness, then we're not going to stand in your way. But you have to know clearly um, what it is God is calling you to. And I know how much you want to be there to support your family. And maybe God is saying, be patient until you can be put in a different country and then be in a position to be able to provide for your family. But I don't know what God is telling you to do. And we don't know what God is telling you to do. Um, and we know how complicated it is. The only thing we can say is that we're praying for you to have wisdom because it is a very, very, very hard question that you face. I mean, you know, I, I still don't know too what I'm supposed to do. I still don't know what is the God's planning for me. Well, when you don't know, you wait. That that's something I do know. If you don't know clearly, then you're in the waiting, the waiting game. You're in the waiting area. When you don't know yeah. what to do, you don't launch out, you wait. Yeah, he's already 11 years past 20. I'm not uh, complaining. I, 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 I know I'm it's okay. terrible. Waiting 11 years, we can't, we can't imagine it. I'm just saying that when you don't have a clear answer about what you're supposed to do, you have to wait. Wait until God gives you the answer. Yes, I'm waiting. I, I believe that. May I add something? This is not connection with Hebrews now. It's, uh, it's in my mind, you know, before we was uh, a study about the revolution, before Hebrews. Mm -hmm. um, before before uh, last and finish the revolution, you asked us, the next uh, Bible study is, uh, you want to study Hebrews or you want to study uh, Genesis, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And uh, I, I, yes, and, and uh, the first one you, I, I, I want to say, I'm, I'm a very sensitive person, and this is not under my control. And you asked uh, uh, Brother Kevin, and he said uh, about uh, Genesis. After that, you asked me exactly, I was the second person you asked me, I said Hebrews. And after that, when you ask uh, other sister brothers, so it's become Hebrews. And since that time, I feel guilty, maybe, uh, you know, I, I feel sorry for Brother Kevin. He, 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 uh, he likes to go to Genesis, but we came to Hebrew. I, I, I want to say sorry about that. I feel, I feel not happy about that. <laughs> sorry. sorry for laughing, but... Um, you don't need to be sorry. You don't need to be sorry. Yeah. Um, you don't need to be sorry at, at, at all. Um, those of us, especially who are from Western Europe and, and the United States, um, we, we believe in democracy and things. And so we put it for a vote and everybody had a vote and Kevin lost and Kevin's a big boy and Kevin will get over it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sorry for that. I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I didn't mean anything. It is. <laughs> Can I just bring us back to this, um, to the Bible? Um, I believe that that God had a master plan that went right through to end times. Um, it's not that things went a bit haywire on the way and God had to change his plan, I think he knew exactly how everything was going to play out. Yeah, because it's his plan. Yes, it was his plan. And people, he knew that people wouldn't all be able, he gave them a chance, but they, he knew that it was impossible for them 
to um to keep to the rules and yeah and, so um, god did it he, it wasn't just his plan b that's what i want to get over god didn't make a mistake this is not his plan b bringing jesus in to die for our sacrifice this was his plan all along because jesus was there in the beginning yes amen that's right amen okay well um let me turn off the